Good day, strategy gamers, and welcome back to episode 9 of our War in the East 2 Stalingrad to Berlin campaign Let's Play series. Uh, in this episode, we're going to finish the second half of turn 5, which will mostly be our ground phase south of Smolensk, and then we will also be going through the end of turn phases um, to see how the Germans respond to what we accomplished in this turn, and that will wrap it up for the episode. So, where we left off was in the previous episode, episode 8, we had done our ground phase for Leningrad and had great success there. We moved down to the Smolensk front, as I've been referring to it, and we've had great success here as well. And where we left off was this line, kind of referred to as the, the Western Front, stretches from here down to Stalingrad. So we'll continue reviewing for opportunities to break through. As we did in the last episode, we'll continue to leverage this fort mechanic to make sure that when we're pressing an advantage, we're doing it in the correct locations and not trying to take on or trying to take on head on a, a fortification level of say four um, or something like that with understrength units. Another thing, if I keep saying fort level, my apologies, it is technically fortification level. And the reason I always like to clarify that is because there are actual forts, right, that, that may be replicated here. Um, fortification level just represents how dug in are the units. Are they in foxholes or do they have full trenches or have they started, say, constructing pillboxes or fortified defenses with concrete, right? So that's fortification level. And that's what we're looking at here, which can be toggled on and off with the F key. So we are in December 17th of 1942. And there'll be a couple sections of this front where we have rivers. And at this point, I'm going to assume that the rivers at least are frozen over enough for our infantry to cross. We are on week three, I think, of blizzards and snow. Um, so it obviously has gotten cold enough that um, that water can start freezing. So let's get right to it. And right off the bat, when we're looking at this little pocket here, I think the, the first unit that we probably would have tried to break through against is this um, 291st Infantry Division, not only because its fortification level is the lowest, but also because it only has a defensive combat value of 5. So... I don't know if we're going to have enough strength with this one unit to push through. Yeah, you see, so that's one-to-one -one odds. So maybe we can take one of these units. Let's say maybe this rifle division. And if we moved this down, I'm wondering if that then gives us enough strength in this hex. So this is two-to-one against a lightly of dug in enemies. We're going to go ahead and give it a try. And they retreated. So we, we had some success there. So now when we look at that fortification level, you see that now that hex is empty because it's no longer an enemy hex, right? We, we technically kind of advanced into it to push this unit out, which means those fortifications are now deteriorated, evacuated, they're gone effectively. So next turn, this should make it much easier for us to try to break through in this particular pocket. Continuing on down the line, we already have a bit of a gap in the line right here. And I'm thinking what we'll do is we'll try to use these three to push back this unit. And then we'll use these three to try to push back this unit, if we indeed have the right math. Mm, that's not quite two to one. And that is two to one, but it's still close. I actually don't know that we're going to push the advantage here. I say advantage, we don't even really have an advantage. As I click through these units, what I'm looking at on this info screen is their fatigue level and their combat preparation. And if you remember, right, we have the first number is our combat value, and the second number is our movement value. So think of it as like movement points to be expended to move the unit, right? As combat preparation points increase, so will the combat value. And fatigue also has an effect on this too. And when we attack, it lowers combat preparation points and it increases our fatigue. Um, 
So we may be better off waiting a turn or two for these units to actually recover a little to get up to a higher strength. So I think that's what we're going to do in this little sector. Another reason for that decision is that even if we do successfully push through, and if we, if we push through this turn, what have we gotten? Right, this, this is one of the less strategic areas of the front right here is you're gonna be pushing through some light wood that's not next to any depots or cities or anything like that. What would be a better expenditure of forces would be where we have these lines of supply that lead to these towns, and in this case, even victory points, right? Where that's going to have more of an impact on the war effort. And for example, if, let's say, two turns from now, we've pushed down to this hex right here, that then interrupts the rail resupply that these units are receiving, which then makes that breakthrough here that much easier. So we're going to continue on looking for more opportunities. Um, another one that stands out here is we've got one-to-one, -one, um, or one-and-one, -one, excuse me. So I think we're going to go ahead and attack, and that should shatter that unit even. Route at them. Okay, we'll take that too. That's fine. They're, they're effectively... <laughs> they're pretty much non-combat effective looking at those results. They had like 300 men left over. And I think now... We're actually going to advance this Ninth Guards unit up. We're going to move over... I think we'll move over the 356 Rifle Division. And... We may... Push back this unit. No, again, just not good enough odds. It's not going to be worth it, I feel. Um, but what we will do now is press here. Again, they ha they're not dug in at all, and we have enough units to kind of force the issue. And we'll go ahead and attack, so they've retreated. Excellent. Now the question is, do we have enough to actually advance into this hex? And we don't. I was debating doing a hasty attack instead of deliberate, which would have saved us some of that um, combat preparation and movement, but... We went to deliberate, it worked out. That hex is now, say, technically one of ours, right? It's not an enemy hex, which then means if they want to move back in next turn and fill that gap, it's going to cost them more um, more, more action points, movement points, however you want to refer to it, right, to do so. So I think that's an advantage to us. Down here, we got three to, or we have defensive value of seven and five. I don't think we would have enough to break through here. And we've already expended some of the units that would help with this attack. So we're going to leave that be. Moving along, I think there's another opportunity here, and I feel like we did this last time. But it must not have worked out that great because they, they've come right back. So what else do we have in these two hexes? What if we did a deliberate attack with these guys? Okay, so they've retreated. And then let's take these units, and we're going to move these up to fill in that gap now. Actually, it might be worth... Nope. Delay. Okay. That's fine. So now we, we've gotten in and we've created this little bit of a pocket where they have to start looking at where their forces are going to be deployed, which is good, right? We want them to make those difficult decisions. We're going to toggle the units off, and this makes it easier now to capture Vreklev, which will be a benefit because now this little pocket of units can also get resupply from this rail line. Right now, because they hold this city, they're not getting any reinforcements from the rail line that they're actually sitting on, right? So that's going to be a benefit to us as well once we can push back this unit. I don't think we would have enough to do anything that yeah, we they're, they're too dug in, too strong there right now. That's fine. Here we see we have a couple of security units, and these are the same ones that I actually think we've been pushing back the last couple turns. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to move this unit here, this cavalry. I'm going to have that.
that attack this unit, so they retreat it. Right? And then this tank core is going to move up. Oh, no, I've, I've gone and done this wrong now, I think. They might now hold. The reason I did this reposition, though, is one, I can create a bigger pocket for them to defend over here now that they've redeployed on this side. And two, I want to try to make it down here and, and cut off this. Um, <laughs> Marzi? Marmzi? Maybe? That might be it. I don't know. Um, we'll have to do a little bit of practice with some of those. And here, they're, they're pretty well defined in this entire line. So we're going to let some of these units simply um, refresh themselves, recoup a little, right? Have a little bit of shore leave on the front line, what have you. Um, I may have been too aggressive with this, this move right here, and I'm actually debating if I don't move it back. Because it's, it's in a difficult supply position. It has 44 fatigue, which is pretty high. And it is now very much so behind enemy lines. Hmm. Wonder if maybe I don't do this. Yeah, here's what we're going to do. We're going to reinforce this here. And then this is this is gonna be like musical chairs for a minute or two here. I'm gonna move this unit up here. This unit will go here. This one here. And this one here. So we move down our line and note that the fortification levels stay the same, right? And that's because the the hex did not change hands. So if we were actually, if, if you picture this in your heads so of this happening in real life, right? If if we want it to move this division up and then another one over and kind of leapfrogging off of each other, right? Because we're handing off to friendly units, it can be, ah, comrade, uh, here is my foxhole. Go ahead and have yourself a seat, right? Uh, that's the conversation as opposed to when the hex changes hands, um, those fortifications are kind of for naught now, right? They're, they're facing the wrong direction, if you will. And you can see that is evident here. These fortification levels, this was our old front line a turn or two ago. And, and these will slowly start to deteriorate as they become unoccupied. So over time, these are going to go back down to zero in these hexes. But if we had to retreat this turn, those trenches are still here in this hex, right? They're, they're still usable. So we, we've done that, and I feel like I'm in a much better position than with this unit that I kind of overextended a little. Um, and now I ask myself, do I push that unit back? I think I do. Shatter them, right? So that, that's, that's just gone now. And with that, it increases the size of a pocket that they have to try to, to build around us. So one option they will have is going to be moving these units over and they might try to cut us off. So that is a risk that we should be aware of. But if they do that, I think they might worry a little bit about us being behind their lines and us breaking through in other areas anyways, and then the front just collapsing, right? The safe and more conservative bet, uh, at least if I were in their shoes, would be to try to contain this breakout as opposed to a counterattack that might actually just weaken the entire front line. My, my money is they're going to kind of redeploy and, and try to get between us and, my, for, for goodness sake, we, we don't have any recon on it, but what's to say in a turn or two we couldn't get to Kursk? We'd probably run out of supply, but maybe we could do air resupply for a while. I mean, that, that's a pretty real threat for them. Um, they probably have a number of their air armies stationed here in these air bases, right? So the, these are serious considerations they have to make. The other thing is that while there are two chips in these hexes, uh, well, these two at least, 
Um, the second one is just a Luftwaffe field division that is pretty much as, as weak as it can get, and that's where we were pressing the advantage in the previous turn. They actually brought in the 206th and the 205th Infantry Division, it looks like, to reinforce the line because of the success we had. Um, so this, this is going well over here. This is going very well. Moving down here to this front line, uh, you see that we've been pretty aggressive with this group, um, just based off of how far we've advanced the front, right? So I'm not going to go too crazy with this 17th Tank Corps, but what I probably will try to do is to knock back this um, Netherlands SS Infantry Regiment um, and maybe even extend out to this Luftwaffe Field Division to then alleviate the pressure on the flank of my 17th Tank Corps. So let's go ahead and give that a try. So if we take both these units as a deliberate attack, not the greatest odds, but we, we pushed them back. And now we can move those units up. And we're also going to push here. And we've, that Luftwaffe division has now retreated. I was hoping we might have enough to actually advance all the way to the Hex, but it doesn't look like we will. Which, which is okay. Um, this hex might be a little, a little weak because they have combat value only of two now after that's said and done. In this unit, we really... We, audience, please remind me that when I do the next episode, this unit needs to stay and rest. It, it cannot continue at the rate it's, uh, it's advancing. Uh, it needs to rest. And the same can be said with, oh my gosh... I wish I would have seen this. That is awful. 85 and 87 fatigue. We, we have to fix that. Otherwise, if they counterattack, those units might shatter on the very first engagement. So we're going to move over the 100th Rifle Division, which is in a much better state to try to help defend that hex. That's, that's too much of a risk for us to take, especially considering the strength that they have in this particular hex. Um... And one of the best things we can do to try to alleviate the situation is to put pressure on each flank of this mass that they have of units right here. So we're going to see if we can't push back this unit here to do just that. So very good. And then here we're just going to hold, I think, these. Okay, so these are all part of the 60th Army. I think we're just going to bypass this unit right here. We're going to keep moving these units down. It's not really a reason not to. So now that we've entered their zone of control, we can't, it's too costly to move into that hex. And we don't have enough strength to dislodge that unit. So we'll continue moving up our forces here. Okay, so that, that's going very well. Very happy with how this is progressing. Um, because while they do have some points where they might be able to launch a successful counterattack for here, for example, or over here, what we're doing is we're causing so many gaps on their front lines that they're going to have to respond to filling those instead of being on the counterattack. Is my hope, at least. My goodness me. Maybe the uh, AI is just light years ahead of me here, and I'm I'm twiddling my thumbs, thinking I'm all set. That could be a horrible, horrible assumption to be making. Down here, we've got a pretty good pocket of units that have been working up their strength, and if we can get to um, this hex here, this is a this is really bad. Then for the supply lines going up here to this pocket, right? Because this only two routes that they have right now and the other one we're about to cut off as well right so if we were to break through right here and then the next turn if we can take this hex that then means everything here will become i don't want to say completely out of supply but they won't have any type of rail or road network to get resupplied on uh, which effectively is is almost the same thing in this so 
right here I'm kind of looking at this as probably the most likely route of advance because we have something in the defensive value of four and a defensive value of two. So let's see if we can't push this then. We take both of these in the deliberate attack. So this is pretty close to one to one, but I want to try to do it because what I'd really like is um, for these units not to have exhausted any of their movement points so they can advance south. So they held. Okay. That, that's not terribly surprising. If we did the attack again, we don't even have enough points to do so. Okay. So what if we take these two? Oh, no, we're, we're going to have to do all of them. And the Italian Mountain Division was committed to the defense, so they held. I feel like this is deja vu. We've had this happen before. I think we've attacked this hex before in this exact same manner. This has all happened in, in the past. I can feel it. Okay. So that, that did not work out as I'd hoped. I remember, I remember now, though, that I had that same plan last turn, and it, it did not pan out. Which... That, that happens. That's okay. I think what we'll do is we'll move up this artillery division, though, to maybe help with the, um, the next assault that we have here on these units. Continuing on, though, we have some great opportunity here to continue breaking out. Um, so maybe this is even where it's more realistic that we really have this push that's successful. If we were just to take these, do we stand a chance there? Hmm. What if I'd already moved it there? Okay. So let's instead say we're going to take these units and attack here. And they held. Interesting. So what we're going to do now is attack from this side with the 5th Mechanized Corps. And what we're going to do is we're going to assign support units if we have them, and we do in the 6th Army. And I think what we're going to do is attach... Hmm. Oh, so let me think about this. So let's look at the results of that last battle. What was it like? So they held the line, and this is... This is a unit that has a moderate number of armored horses helping it. Um, so it looks like their Italian tanks, the L-335s, is the bulk of what they have. I'm not terribly familiar with that unit. I should probably refresh myself on it. Um, okay. And it was all... HE because of the fact it was fighting an infantry advance. Fair enough. What did they have in terms of anti-tank guns? Hmm. Okay, so this I'm a little less worried about. Really, the big threats that they have would be, of course, the, the infamous 88s that I'm sure most of the viewers have heard about. But the second would be the 75mm um, Pac-40 AT and Pac-38 anti-tank guns. Um those would be the most dangerous to us as we advanced with armor. So I think what we're going to do is take our... I need to switch back to remove mode. We're going to take our 5th Mechanized core and we're going to attach to it the 8th Tank Brigade and the 86th Tank Brigade. Um, and then we're also going to take the 6th Anti-Tank Brigade and attach all of those. And this has... Yeah, this is good. I think this is going to work quite well. So we'll close that. We now have these three support units assigned. That also increased the combat value of the unit. Now we're going to attack. And we route at them. We route at them, and then it looks like the Italians didn't help in the defense at all, and that's probably why we routed them. So... Not, not exactly what I expected from that. Um, 
I think we'll continue to press here against this unit. Yep, so they retreated as well. And then if we press our advance here, yeah, so we're breaking through now. This is good stuff. We're now going to take this tank core. We're going to advance it. I would really like to press all the way to that line, but I don't think we're going to. We'll let that unit kind of recuperate a little here. And then I'm tempted to just go around this unit. The only reason I don't want to is I have such strong divisions here that I would hate to for them not to see any action and just hold the line there, right? It seems like a bit of a waste of their talents, if you will. Hmm. So what if we did just attack? Just with those two units, it's 33 to 14. Let's go ahead and do it. And they retreat it. Okay. Excellent. I'm just gonna move them up. Them up. Right, just to continue holding this front. And then we're going to take the units we have here and see if we can't break through again. We did. Good news, good news. And this tank core is very high on fatigue and I should not be aggressive with it like I was about to. So we're not going to go and press that. But I think we can take these units, attack here, and we routed them. Excellent. Okay. And do they still have enough left to go here? They do. We have had some wonderful success here. This is this is all good news. Okay. So we've really pushed back their lines here. And I could move up almost every single one of these units even further. But as we cycle through them, we see that fatigue is getting high on almost every one of these units. So for that reason, we're going to lead them here. And because they're not sitting on a front line against an enemy unit or hex... Um, they're going to recover that fatigue much more quickly and combat preparation points because when when the game represents here, let's just look at this kind of front line between the two forces, right? Uh, the 197th Rifle Division is sitting here. This hex represents 10 miles worth of area and they're defending that 10-mile stretch, right? And on the other side of that 10-mile stretch is the 88th Infantry Division, the 251st Infantry Division, 340th, the remaining Armored Division, it's just all of these things right there. They are all sitting and bordering on portions of that 10-mile hex. How the game simulates fatigue and supplies and, and what happens even when you don't attack someone is that just like was reality in World War II is just because there was not an offensive at the division level or the regiment level doesn't mean that fighting didn't happen on the front line. Right? Picture in the movies the two static positions, right, with snipers across no man's land and a patrol going out at night to try to capture prisoners to interrogate. All of these things would be happening in World War II on a front like this if two units were in such close proximity. And when the fighting men are in that situation, that's not really rest, right? That, that's just the day-to-day -day of being a soldier without a huge advance. You're, you're sitting there and it feels like every single day you're fighting, so your fatigue doesn't really recover. But here with these units, they know that the nearest enemy is, say, 20 miles away. Right? They're not sitting there staring down across no man's land, a sniper that might catch them any minute, or going on patrols right against the enemy. This is just, it's, it's not R&R, the unit's not being refit, but they're not on a static front line against an enemy. So their fatigue's going to recover more quickly. 
And now we start to get into the section which is just south of Stalingrad here. And we have some pretty, pretty strong defensive units that the Germans have right here. And we're not going to press any type of advantage. If anything, I actually worry a little looking at this of just how strong these are and are they maybe thinking about some type of breakout. But I, of course, that, that's really quite nonsense. There's, there's no way they would be successful in that. So I, I think we should just be cautious of opportunistic counterattacks they may have to just try to inflict damage on us. Um, and we have to be a little more passive in this little pocket. But again, I think we will see these units start to redeploy as the Germans sit there and go, this is not sustainable. We need a front line that we can defend. Because when you look at these units, they are in, let's see, so this is poor roads, clear, but I thought I was reading these hexes right, but maybe I'm not. So these are planes, I guess. I thought, I thought maybe these were woods, but anyways, there's no rail lines. There's no roads, really, major roads, I should say, that are leading to supply these units. You have entire panzer divisions here that are pretty far away from their supply lines. And they're not going to want our more mobile mechanized units cutting them off and enveloping them, just as we've done at Stalingrad. So I would predict that this pocket right here pulls back and retreats in the next turn. And they try to establish a new defensive line somewhere here. With all of that said, I think we might take one of these units and actually just move it over here. So a more aggressive me would say, let's try to, to knock that unit out. But I think we're going to take the 333rd Rifle Division and we're actually going to move it over to try to help hold this line. Because right now, the 266 only has to worry about this one Jaeger division, which is much weaker than what's sitting over here. We're also going to move up the 61st Rifle Division, and we will move up the 52nd Guard to that same location. Actually, I think we will take the 51st guard and put them there. And we'll move up this artillery division to here. And we're going to keep building out this front line of ours. Excellent. So that's working quite well. Not really anywhere that we are going to press an advantage, especially because we're already a little outnumbered on the flanks of this 3rd Cavalry Corps. Um, and if you remember some of these units, I'm sure I'll find one here eventually, uh, really pressed hard and fast for us, so their fatigue might be a little higher. But looking through all of them, they're actually pretty okay. But we're not going to get too aggressive, even though they are looking pretty reasonable right now. Getting a little worried because we've had this little gap where we just have one division kind of in the rears to, to protect this two hex front. Um, I was hoping that by now we might have had some more reinforcements from the collapse on Stalingrad that could have been relocated. We're probably okay to go another turn. I don't think they're going to be in an, in an offensive posture to really push some type of advance here. So we're going to leave that be as is still. We'll wrap up in this little pocket and then we'll get on to Stalingrad to see where there's opportunity. Um, could maybe do something here with the 4th Panzer Division. Wow. So that's 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So just here there are 9 Panzer Divisions. Does that worry anyone else? I... I, I, I know a fair amount of Eastern Front history, but I'm trying to remember if this was historical that the Germans tried to move up this huge mass of panzer forces in one pocket. I just don't remember hearing anything about that. Maybe they did, though. And that's not to say that I expect the AI to play out to historical outcomes. Um, more so, I'm just trying to take lessons and learnings from history, right? Because if 
if the Germans on the ground trying to rescue the forces in Stalingrad thought it was a good idea back in 1942, maybe the AI will think so too, right? Um, so I think we're just going to really hold our front line here. And depending on how our resolutions go in Stalingrad, we may look to redeploy one of the armies to help reinforce this. Because that, that just worries me a little. Especially as we look down here. Okay, but that is a different part of the episode. So let's continue on with Stalingrad. And where, where do we have the most opportunity here? So I think, I think this little kind of pocket and area continues to be our best bet to collapse in on them. Taking off the fortification level indicators, um, it lets us see a little bit better our intelligence on the supply of these units. And this actually, this, this settles me a little because now as I look at this, these panzer divisions that they moved up, almost all of them have some type of supply situation that they're currently in. So it's not to say we don't need to not worry about them now, that everything's perfectly fine. That's, that's not what I'm trying to get across. More so that I don't think they're in a position that next turn they could launch some massive offensive um, and break out, right? I, I don't even necessarily worry about these guys making it and breaking out the Stalingrad forces, although it is a threat. I worry more so just about how they could envelop this army, um, surround them, cut them off, and really shatter them, and then I'm, I'm just one less army on this entire front. They can then pull back, reorganize. That's my concern. My concern isn't necessarily that they have enough strength to push through and to free the forces in Stalingrad. So I think we will look at maybe these two hexes, maybe this one, as opportunities to attack. But considering that they are still in a good supply situation, it seems I'm not going to be aggressive. So looking at these units too, they're all pretty high on fatigue for us as well. Maybe the entire Stalingrad pocket just deserves a, a week off? What are your thoughts on that? Mm, but looking at this... We have such tremendous odds here. I think I am going to push the advantage. So we're going to, with these units here, attack. They surrendered and retreated. So now we move these forces up. I don't think they attacked, did they? Let's press this. They retreated again. Okay. If we use all of these to attack here, two to one. Let's do it. Let's do it. They held. Darn it. Okay. Fair enough. Let's now see what we can do here. Retreated and surrendered. Okay. That's the outcome we want it. Move up these units. What I'm debating here is taking the 65th Army and redeploying it south. I think I'm going to do that. The 65th Army is going to redeploy to the south. That's what we're going to do. So we're going to move these units down south. So let's bring all of these here. This one's in the 65th but it does not have enough movement to, to go. And here we just have this unit, the 24th, so we can bring them down. And we have the 4th guard here. So we're going to move 
them down as well. And then we have this artillery division. And then we'll move their HQ. So let's bring them down here. Okay. Very good. So. We can now take a couple of these units that were sitting in the rear, who were resting, if you will. We're going to move them up. Can they attack there? What if we take these guys? They held again. Okay. All right. And here we had been moving up the second guard's army. Right, if you recall that. So I think we might take the second guard's army. And we're also going to redeploy them here to the south. We might redeploy them. Hmm. I'm thinking the 65th army can be deployed down here to this side. And then we will take this second guard's army. And we will use them to continue our breakout here. Moving down this rail line, if you will. So then we can have the 65th Army advance on this rail line, the Guards Army and the 21st Army advance on this rail line, and then the 51st Army can be focused just kind of on holding this flank. Let's do that. So I'm just going to select all these to try to make it go a little faster. Oh, we cannot move as far as I probably would have liked. That's okay. So we're just going to go down here. And then also move up this mechanized group and we will move up the HQ okay I need to remember not to forget about those um, <laughs> uh, next turn so looking up here I'm betting again we don't really have enough to push through we were close on this one if I remember right last turn 26 to 16, yeah. But I think we will continue to hold. And here we only have a combat value of 9 to attack with. And they have, they have 214. What do you know to defend with? Yeah, look at this too. See, I'm really glad we didn't attack there because those are the combat values just for the units. It's not necessarily taking into effect the, um, the combat outcomes of having fortification levels of 4. And if you remember our summary from the other day, fortification level of four means they've they've spent three to six months pouring concrete to have really fortified defensive destruct stru yeah, structures. Excuse me. This isn't simply trenches. This is concrete reinforced permanent installations that they're sitting in to defend themselves. So we're going to we have some units. Here. Here, we're going to leave them in the rear, unless, no. What we're going to do is we're going to flip out, flip out's probably not the right term, but we're going to, um, we're going to take some units that are higher on fatigue and we're going to take them off the front line and we're going to reinforce them with these units that have no fatigue. That's what we're going to do. So they can go back there. We have the same thing here, but we've got two units that can kind of let them. So we'll take them up there. Oh gosh darn it, I moved the wrong one. This is the one I want. We will take this unit. Okay, just kind of a rotation of the forces, because fatigue levels are high on some of these. We left off down here on our southern, um, well, south of Stalingrad, I should say, and we're going to keep, I think we'll like move this up one, move this unit here. We're 
we're just gonna we're gonna try to create this defensive line that we can work with. Right. And here I'm gonna start building all of this out. The goal isn't necessarily to advance our positions, right? The the goal is holding a front. So to that end. Some areas will advance, but in others we're just going to stay for the most part on this north-south route that we're currently at. Okay. So this HQ unit then I'm gonna move up here. So we have this unit here that is just outside. If we go here, then that one is. So we're gonna stay right there. And next turn, we'll try to move them up north a little more. Okay. Are they out of supply? Not out of supply, but out of range here. So it may be worth moving them up. Yeah, I think it probably is. Okay, good stuff. And if you remember from the previous episode, we captured this rail line north, which should help get supplies here to a lot of these units. And then what we're going to do is, long term, we will push this front up here to Devno. And um, if we can capture this line down to Kuban, then this can all... We, we have We have means by which to resupply in these remote areas, where if you look at their forces... Uh, they're they're starting to get a little ways away from their line of supply. I just do worry that this this looks like an entire army that has moved down here, um, which is not something we were dealing with previously. So this is a bit of a new development on the front line. We need to continue though with our movement on the uh, Caucasus front in the south, and then we will end our turn. So we're just going to keep advancing some of these units where we can. was hoping that would have um, made some of these hexes friendly. And here, let's advance this unit. So we captured a depot, which is always nice. It's always nice. Move this unit up. in here. We are on the march. Some of these units were going to go a little bit more directly west, I would say. To put pressure right here from their northern front. Not mean to move that so far. We don't want it to go too far south though because the terrain is really hindering our movement there. units. Okay, good stuff. These guys are really low on supply. So that's only a two to one if we attack. And I don't know why we would give up the, the defender's advantage that we have in this situation right now. This unit, I wonder, 
move move east or west with this unit. I think we move west. So we seem to have plenty of help over here. We don't have any intel on that unit. Okay. So it's the 19th Romanian. Captured a depot. That's always nice. Right, so they can now go up here. It looks like we can actually capture my cop. Well, another another victory for the Soviets people. Now we're going to start moving up here on this road north. I think we have enough forces here to, to handle the Krasnodar front. Okay, we'll take this one here. Start kind of scouting what's on the flank of these units that are moving north. And then we're going to take... Okay, so this unit doesn't... is part of this army. So we're going to go up here and occupy my cop. Over here we kind of want something similar. Because what happened was we got completely out of touch with these units. I think that's really hurt us. Um, down here we will kind of continue this liberation of these hexes. I do wonder if this is something that I can cross because it's so narrow. If we can, that... <laughs> if, if we can, then the question begins, do we begin an assault on the Crimea? Um, but I don't know that we're going to be able to. I don't know that I'm mentally ready or have thought enough about what that would entail. guys up. Move up the HQ unit there. The Krasnodar. Move. Hmm. A little torn on where to move that one. These, these two we can't keep out there too long because they're out of range of their HQ. But that, I think, wraps up our ground movement phase for Turn five, we're going to do one last thing, and that is look at our theater boxes. So you see we've got these two green icons and an orange. So when we look at the Far East, we see that we're meeting our obligations. When we look at the Transcaucus theater box, we are meeting our obligations. And then we get to the Northern Front, and we're just a bit of a disappointment. So we're going to send more air units from the Reserve box to the Northern Front. So to do so, we're going to open up our Reserve theater box, go to Air, and we're going to take some units here and transfer them over to the Northern Front. Um, so... I'm looking at these fighters, and most of these, right, they don't have any... It looks like they don't have any airframes ready. This one has 17, though. We might hold on sending fighters, but what we can send is some fighter bombers. So we'll transfer some of these. Probably going to do four, I think. No, we'll, we'll do five fighter bombers. And we're just trying to get a good mix here. So we've had a couple of Yaks, we've got the LA-5F. Um, really giving them a good mixture. And then I don't think it makes sense to put a night fighter up there as it looks like the requests and the thresholds were simply for day air. So we're also going to do some 
um, tactical bombers. And here we have a lot of units that... Yeah, there's some here, so we're going to do two that look like they're ready. And then level bombers, I don't really think makes sense for the northern front. We can send them a couple of recon if we have any, though. So let's do these two. These are PE2Rs. I'm going to send them two of those. And hopefully this helps with our commitment to the air campaign in the northern front. Okay. So we've successfully done that. Uh, we're going to just triple check that we have the AI helping with our depot management. So we'll let that run. And now that we've done that, I think we can close out this ground phase turn. So we're going to hit end turn. I don't think I'm forgetting anything. And we'll let this go through and do a bunch of simulations like we usually do. And we'll talk about what we see is happening. Um, right off the bat, you see it looks like this air army in the Caucasus region is trying to do air resupply to those forces that had pushed towards the Crimean Peninsula. And over here, we're just making sure that some key units are getting resupplied. It doesn't look like we're really having any losses, which I am... I am not going to complain about. I I need to keep my mouth shut. Look at that. Just lost two right after I say that. So now we're on the German logistics phase. Here they're going through setting up their depots. And, you know, this is a pretty important phase because I think in the last turn alone we captured five German supply depots on the front lines. Um, so that, that's a, it's a pretty big deal. And that really has impacts then to those divisions and their supply situation, which then impacts their combat effectiveness. So this is going to continue on for another minute, and then it's going to get to the German air execution phase, which I'm expecting to be rather dull as we're now in week three of blizzards and snow. But maybe, maybe they'll decide to throw away all their planes trying to do, I don't know, strategic bombing or something on our industry, which would be a little silly. Um, especially considering that uh, after the outbreak of war, uh, the Soviets made the decision to actually take their industrial base, their industrial complex that really was heaviest in the um, what would be considered the eastern portions of the Soviet Union. I'm sorry, the western portions, closer to Europe, right? So... Uh, republics and territories that they had conquered and kind of moved into Europe. That was really kind of the industrial base of the Soviet Union in 1941. When the Germans attacked, what they did is they actually took entire factories, put them up on rail cars, and they moved all of the factory equipment and the people um, out east beyond the Ural mountain range. Right? Effectively so far away from the front line that... Even the best estimates of the German high command wouldn't have had them make it that far in the first year of the campaign. None of them would have. The, their, their thought was make it to Moscow, make it to Leningrad, make it to Stalingrad, and what you're going to do is just kind of collapse upon the Soviet Union, all their leadership and all their structure, um, which obviously didn't happen. So strategic bombing then really wasn't a thing that you saw on the Eastern Front because the Soviets had moved their industry so far away from the front lines that it wasn't really necessarily in range. And for the Germans, right, looking at a map, you can clearly see these front lines right now are pretty far away from the heartland of Germany and where their factory production was. Um, compared to, say, the air wars of the Allies in Western Europe against Germany, where strategic bombers could fly from England and bomb the heartland of Germany, affecting their industrial capacity. That didn't happen on the Eastern Front necessarily. So it looks like we've had a couple of... Whoa, okay. So we had a unit routed and two retreated there. This is near the Smolensk Front. Um, and then we saw north towards Leningrad, we actually held out against an attack. We successfully defended, so... We had one good victory, and then we had one 
I don't want to say shattering defeat because we didn't have our units shattered, but we, we had a heavy loss. We defended... Oh, that's good. I'm glad we moved that unit up. So we defended ourselves there. And we did it twice now. Look at this. Can we do it a third time? We did it a third time. Wow. What heroes defending that line? Again, I need to keep my mouth shut. There we go. They retreated. Um, but that probably really exhausted those units. And you can already see how they've redeployed themselves to try to stop the advance of those units that broke through. We held the line there on that rail line, which is good, but here we had to retreat, it looks like. Very interesting. Had another retreat. I'm, I'm not really bothered necessarily by that because they're... We have so many holes in their front line that if they do want to counterattack like that, we're just going to continue pushing forward. Um, and we, we have the numbers here. We, we are in the offensive position. Yeah, look look right down there by that tank core that we had. How they're now redeploying their front line to prevent that from cutting off some of their sources of supply. Exactly as we thought would happen. The only difference is they did, chose to do a counterattack to push back some of our forces before they redeployed their front line. That's effectively what has happened. And they were smart when we look at it here to have knocked this unit out because now if we capture all of this, this is another turn where we have to get these rail lines back into effect to supply this advance. That was pretty clever of them to, to go ahead and do that. And here they're just doing repositioning again of their defensive line, so just like we thought, right? They redeployed their forces to create a defensive line instead of counterattacking and trying to encircle our units. Um, so now we're going to have an opportunity to create a defensive line of ourselves to protect that advance and breakout that we had happening. I'm wondering if this is going to change. Look at this, those panzer divisions we are so worried about. It looks like they had moved them. Uh, I'm going to be very curious to see if that holds true um, when we get to the next episode of the series. They're now going through and doing our, their air supply of freight. Their turn is now done. It's calculating our logistics decisions. And then this is going to be wrapping up the turn here momentarily. What a blast this episode's been. I've really enjoyed this one. I, I hope you all have as well. Um... I think the campaign is just really starting to get interesting, and I like it because I can already feel that six turns into the game, um, I find myself in a position of where I'm not exactly certain what the Germans are going to do to some of our attacks, which is really exciting as a human player in a strategy game like this. Um, whereas turn one of the scenario, you sit there and you go, okay, yeah, so here's the front lines... The Russians are obviously going to try to surround Stalingrad. Okay, sounds good. Um, you, you know some of those events and how they might play out. Now we're starting to get into some details that are either more granular than my own understanding of the history is, um, or because of the decisions we've made for the past six turns, they are non-historical events that didn't happen, so we, we can't necessarily expect them then. Uh, trends might stay the same, but they're, the actions they're taking today were not replicated um, 80 years ago. And now we come to our turn summary. So as always, we're going to do a quick review of this and then the news events. Friendly losses of 58,000 men. That, again, is staying right within what we've been averaging every turn. 930 guns, 257 armored fighting vehicles, and 255 airframes lost. The airframe surprised me a little. I know we had those recon missions go out, but I didn't know we had lost this many. I thought it was closer to 20 for the recon missions. So we must have lost some of these through some type of ground support or air superiority during the Germans' turn. Order of battle changes. So the net change is that we're positive 12,000 men. Net change for the Germans is they're down 50,000. So again, you start to see that that tide really coming into effect of Soviets having momentum with the reinforcements and manpower. In total, we were negative again on guns, and this is a trend we've seen for a couple turns now and have commented on. It's something we need to be careful of. 
armored fighting vehicles, we saw some growth. In airframes, we saw some growth. Our low supply units increased a little from previous turn. We were at 33, I think. Um, so it went up, but it's not a huge jump. And then it looks like we had some units that might have come in as reinforcements that are unready. Under strength is at 26. Now moving on to the news events. Same one as we've had. Soviet partisans continue to intensify in occupied territory. All right, that brings this episode to a close. As always, thank you so much for giving the series a watch. Um, if you have any comments, suggestions, or feedback for the videos, would love to hear them in the comments section. And if you'd be so kind for a like or a subscribe to the video, it really helps get this series out there and hopefully gives some more exposure to this fantastic game. So thank you all so much for watching, and I hope you all have a great day today. Bye now.